to the invitation. You just pull the white phone up and there's a button in the middle of it. Just give that a press and it really lights the office. And the floor's yours. How's that working? Beautiful. All right, so... Uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, just in terms of a bit of background of who we are. So, Farrah is one of Dunedin's and probably one of New Zealand's old, oldest businesses. We've been around for about a little over 150 years. Um, no, no, I, I'm the second generation. Um, so, we, uh, we do all kinds of engineering from, um, from heavy fabrication, precision engineering, sheet metal, powder coating, and we employ about 150 people between here and our Christchurch facility. So I'm quite new to Dunedin and relatively new to Farrah. I've been here for about six months. And when I came to town, I actually I should tell you the purpose of me being here is to talk about a development fund bid we're putting together for an engineering hub in Dunedin. Um, when I came here, I was sort of quite surprised by the level of uh, innovation and manufacturing that was still going on here because I'd, all I'd seen was the bad news stories in the media for my whole life just about. So there's a real, there's a real depth of knowledge and a real passion for manufacturing here still and it's, it's been allowed to, to wilt a little bit. And so as a new CEO I was uh, tasked with of course looking at the future direction of Farrah and developing a plan that will see us through another 50 years. And looking at some of the issues that face the company, uh, decline in traditional markets, um, export competitiveness and all of that, there's definitely still some real challenges ahead of us. And so we're looking at what we can do differently and, and how we can harness innovation and, and really focus on high value markets. And probably the catalyst for this was looking at uh, defence opportunities in Australia where uh, I attended a conference in December where they talked about their need for supply out of New Zealand. And the reality is, I realised at that point, that there's, there are very few companies here or in Australia that have the depth of expertise and the uh, strength of balance sheet and the, the history to be credible suppliers into defence because it's a, very, it's a very challenging market. So we thought, great, that's, that's excellent news for Farrah. We can definitely get a slice of that. Let's, let's go for it. But when I came back and thought about it, I realised that there are a lot of uh, smaller engineering companies, not just in Dunedin, but around the region, who have a, the same challenges as us, but not necessarily the same ability to do anything about it. And so that's where the idea of a hub came up, was to say, well, if we, if we find a way of working together, um, how can we leverage all of those skills and all of those resources to the benefit of the whole region rather than just for one company. Um, and so that's when I sort of looked at the, the development uh, fund and said, how can we use that as a, as a bit of a catalyst? To give you an idea, the defence uh, opportunity in itself is um, about varying estimates, 100 to $200 billion of new capital expenditure over 10 years. So we would only need a fraction of a percent of that to make a material difference to Dunedin. And it's not the Australian government that's awarding those contracts, it's private international contractors who actually have no bias between New Zealand or Australia, uh, but they do have to buy out of New Zealand or Australia. So we're actually on a very level playing field with the other potential suppliers into that market. But we don't want to just focus on one thing. So we said, well, what are the, what are the shortages? We need to collaborate better. We need to get better at education. So we have a skills shortage here. It's very hard for us to find skilled tradespeople. It's very hard for us to find skilled engineers. So if we're going to get another 50 or $100 million worth of work into the region for export engineering work, which is actually very achievable, uh, how are we going to resource that for people? So we need, we need education to be on board. We need industry to be working closely together so that not just companies like mine, but all this, the smaller owner-operated five and ten man businesses have a fair uh, opportunity to take that business on. So looking at all of that, looking at the opportunity, looking at the willingness to collaborate that I've seen here, um, I see a real opportunity for a resurgence of engineering. And, and Dunedin was New Zealand's engineering leader for at least 120 years from the 1860s through to the 1980s. So it's relatively recently that it's dropped off and we, 
we frankly don't hold that position anymore. Um, but there's no reason we can't retake it. It's still in the DNA. We still have a lot of, a lot of businesses that are doing some really innovative, innovative work here. Um, ourselves in some of the construction space, um, the likes of Scott Technology, companies that are growing, but not actually growing a lot locally because we're having to hire um, in other cities or other parts of the country to, to meet our international demand. So the purpose, of the, the purpose of the bid for the cluster is to get industry and education working together with the support of the government to create what we're, what we're saying should be 500 high value jobs in Dunedin um, and, its, and its surrounds. Uh, that's tradespeople, that's uh, engineers and, and the professionals to support them. And I think that with the right support from government, we, we can definitely do that. Um, the demand is there. We've talked defence. There's, um, you know, looking at my company, we are fighting off opportunities with a stick at the moment um, internationally for some of our construction stuff. Uh, and again, struggling to, with the infrastructure and the people to actually execute on those opportunities. And I can't name names, but I, I know several other companies in our industry who have similar stories. So, um, so I'm grateful that uh, the, the council has come out and said that um, they're uh, at, at least uh, nominally behind what we're doing and supportive of it, but I wanted to come here today and let you know why we're doing it, what it is, and give you the opportunity to answer, uh, to ask any questions that you might have about where we're at and, and what, we're actually, what we're actually doing. Thanks, Gareth. It sounds like a fairly exciting proposal, and I can see a number of councillors who want to ask you questions. You're happy to take questions? Absolutely. All right. First up, Councillor Benson Pope. Um, thanks, Gareth. Um, historically, there's been um, some resistance from um, your company uh, and others now vacant, uh, now no more, um, to and concern, perhaps would be better, around the sensitivity of other developments in the area. I know you're aware of some of the proposals on the board for the immediate waterfront area. Is there any conflict there between what you're proposing and welcome an initiative like this hub and what you see the council supporting or trying to initiate? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good question and I, I do acknowledge that we haven't exactly been leading the charge in terms of progress historically. Um, I actually think that the, that the proposals work together really well. Um, one of our big things is we've got, we're, we're pitching to multi-billion dollar organisations, whether it's defence or construction or anyone else. When we bring those people in from overseas, as we do regularly, they um, come into our industrial area and what they see is a, is a tired old area. And that makes it hard for us to say that we're the world leaders in this technology or that technology, but look at our buildings and look at our environment. Um, so I think that uh, I think that there's been a short-term view. I think that there's been a, a disconnect between the goals of industry and the goals of some of the developers. But I don't think that that has to be the case. I think it needs, if we engage properly, um, the reality is I'm going to be bringing in, and people like me and the engineering hub are going to be bringing in international experts to make our businesses better. Um, sea level, uh, sea level uh, representatives from major corporations. We need a, we need a environment to bring them into which gives them confidence that they're dealing with the right people. And I think if I, if I look 10 years out and I think, you know, we've got the most innovative engineering hub with, with world-class expertise on display in Dunedin City. We've got support from the regions. We've got uh, a city which is, which is demonstrating innovation and doing that through the Harbour Front Precinct and all those other things that are going on. I think that they actually work really well to support that story as of Dunedin as a place where special things come from. And so, to me, the, the different proposals actually reinforce each other really well. Just follow, just follow up. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the actual work, that we understand what work for the Australian Defence Force might be, and it, we understand that's nothing to do with the armament side of the, the hardware. Um, but I'm, am I correct in assuming that uh, that would also that sort of work, heavy engineering or other other fitting and work, would apply to other vessels 
uh, working in the Southern Ocean as well. Absolutely. So we, we know that traffic in the Southern Ocean is going to increase over the next 20 years, probably quite dramatically, both from a scientific and a military and possibly a development perspective. And the, the only ports that are really uh, accessible for support are uh, Otago and uh, Invercargill. So um, there's definitely an opportunity there to support, and we already do. We, if you take a uh, propeller shaft out of a damaged ship in Invercargill, the only place you can take it right now to be fixed is Farrah. Um, so we've, we're already doing a lot of that, but we're doing it ad hoc. So for uh, marine research and patrols of the Southern Ocean and all of that, there's, there's definitely a high capability. We will never recommend that Dunedin gets back into shipbuilding. Those days are gone. But the maintenance and support, you're still talking potentially millions and millions of dollars a year worth of work that is, most of it right now, is having to go 300 k's up the coast to Littleton because we, you know, we haven't really uh, focused on it. So there's definitely a, a big civil opportunity there as well. Councillor Wilson. Um, I think I've got three questions, sorry. First question is, you talked about um, training. Yep. So is it the Polytech working with you or is it more, um, or, or the university, or is it more um, doing apprenticeships? So at, we're at the stage at the moment of uh, applying for funding for a feasibility mm. to answer that question okay. because I've, um, I've sort of I've taken it as far as I can. So I haven't engaged with Polytech or University yet. I've engaged a little bit with uh, Competence because they're on the engineering cluster uh, panel. Um, my view is that what we need is industry working better with, with education providers. So there's a bit of a disconnect between the skills that are being taught and the skills that are in demand. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, there, will, there will be at least trades and either polytech or university and probably all three as part of this mix, I would think. But that's, that's something that has to come out of, the, out of the wash. What I will say is that one of the roles of the hub will be to provide a place where those people who are being trained can come in and learn the best way of doing things and actually use equipment and provide a platform where they're not just sitting in a classroom but they're learning practical skills that, that um, means they can contribute as soon as they come out. And that's, that's a slightly different approach to some of how it's being done now, I think. Great. Um, you talked about the defence work, and I'm presuming that's just a, a catalyst for and, and an opportunity, that there's other engineering work that will, will be set up for this, maybe rail, maybe yep. defences of climate <laughs> um, change, um, and, and, uh, and other things. I think if I was to say this was all about defence, um, yeah. I would be on a very shaky foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the defence thing gives us a single large block of work that when we say, let's take the economic development argument, mm -hmm. just that work satisfies the economic development argument. It doesn't satisfy the whole case. Um, for us, we do a lot of work in the hydropower space um, and in renewables in general, in fact, <coughs> um, refurbishing wind turbines, all of that. Uh, we would like to see more of that being done. You've got companies like Powerhouse Wind here who are, who are developing some really good technologies but not, not getting perhaps the market access that they need or there, there may be other things that they need. So I'd say defence is the immediate large opportunity but renewable energy, climate change mitigation, um, you know, construction, uh, there's, there's a number of other sectors which have long-term growth internationally where the quality of New Zealand innovation and engineering can be leveraged into, into long-term business. And researching those opportunities and developing a plan around them would again be part of the hub so that it can help guide businesses towards more attractive markets. Great. And the last question I had is what do you need or would like from us? Is it actually not just that we've said something nice in the newspaper, but actually a letter of support or something more meaningful? A letter of support would be would be very helpful. Uh, it shows that we're on the same page, and if you if the council was able to provide that, that would be um, that would be enormously useful. Uh, outside of that, what I really want to do is make sure that you're informed. Um, Mr. Benson Pope made the point that that in the past, um, Dunedin in general has has sometimes had uh, an ability to trip over itself, whether it's my company sinking a harbour front proposal or something else. And I think that the important thing is that. We all engage with each other, and so if you guys know what's going on and you see 
uh, something come up in the media or an opportunity that we may have missed or you want to be involved in something, the better I, I keep you informed, the better decisions we can all make together. But there's no material support I'm looking for from Council at this stage. Councillor Lord. <coughs> you know, thanks, Gareth. My, my question was passed out, partially asked by Councillor Vincent Pope, but I was just going to ask, um, in terms of, like, I mean, I know you're saying it's not all military, but, but what would be an example of the types of projects? I mean, surely it's not just bringing every <coughs> Australian ship over to do the propeller shaft or whatever. There'd be much bigger. I'm just wondering if you can give me a, a bit of an idea of what it may involve, what types of work. I certainly can. Um, I'll probably take a little bit of a fairer view of this because that's how I kicked off the defence side of it. But one of our uh, main exports is customised lift and material handling equipment for very challenging environments. Now, on a ship, there that's that's a classic example where that that expertise could be utilised. You need lift equipment for moving helicopters on and off pads. You need lift equipment for deploying smaller vessels from from a boat and you need lift equipment for moving um, material around inside the boat. So that's one big opportunity where we've got expertise and we could, we could target it. There's cabinetry, um, the kitchen fit-outs, there's, uh, there's um, a lot of... So when the Anzac frigates were being done, um, Farrah and ANG Price in, in Thames uh, shared a lot of the uh, uh, heavy machining work for engine components and so forth. Um, I don't know exactly which parts, but uh, so even when you discount armaments, and, and I suspect we would say we want nothing to do with armaments because it's, it's culturally inappropriate to where we think we sit, um, but even outside of that, just with engine parts, lift equipment and cabinetry, you've already got some enormous work streams just, just there. And that's just looking at Navy. That's, if you looked at uh, Land 400, for example, which is another program that's just kicked off for the, the um, light armoured vehicles, um, the swing mounts. So you've got the, the uh, protected mounts that, that rotate on top of the, the vehicle. You know, those things are worth a couple of hundred grand each, and that's an example of something that could be fabricated, chucked in a container, and shipped off to um, one of the prime contractors in Australia. Yeah. And the other, the other question, I'm just sort of thinking, um, is this because the British, uh, sorry, Australian government has declared that this has to be done locally? Yep. Um, because I just, I was just trying to work out what would be the advantage, for example, of someone else making ships like Southeast Asia or wherever they're built. Um, the assumption is that they can build them big enough. So, is there anything about Farah's setup that actually gives a? Oh, I mean. I suppose you're going to say yes to this, but is there something that Farah does better in terms of quality? Not just large, I know you've got a big lathe there and that you can turn those shafts, but is there something that, that Farah's as a New Zealand-based company can do that, for example, we can't get done in places like Asia and other parts of the world? Is there a quality difference? OK, I'm going to answer that in three lengthy parts, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, when it comes to... Uh, I'm going to... Uh, so the... Uh, the first part is around the quality. Now, the reality is we do a lot of high precision work, and particularly in the hydro power space, where it's large things that need to be to be within very, very tight tolerances. So we can show a track record of doing that. Um, as an industry, though, we need to be able to build on that, and that's where I talk about best practice. So, if we want to say that that as a group of as an engineering industry, New Zealand has an advantage in that space. We're not there yet. We've got the opportunity to get there. Um, but in terms of educating people and improving production processes, um, there is definitely work to be done. Um, FAR is probably at the forefront of that, but we'd like to share that with, with other people um, to, to capture these opportunities. Do we have an advantage? If I was going, if I would put aside political parochialism, everything else, and I was going to buy a frigate, I'd get it made in Korea. Um, they make thousands of really good ships every year. Um, the price is good. Um, you know, there's no reason you wouldn't go anywhere else. Uh, but the reality is that there are strategic reasons for not doing that. Australia aren't doing this defence th uh, project as a um, defence force building exercise. If they were, they'd be buying stuff off the shelves. They're doing it as a nation building exercise. And because of CER, they have to include us in that. And so what they're saying is if we're spending these hundreds of billions of dollars, 
but we need to make sure that's coming back in income taxes and in taxes on, on corporations and so forth. So this is an investment in the capability over a long period of time. So politically, they have issued an edict to uh, the suppliers that say you must show a genuine commitment to um, local industry being New Zealand and Australia. And there are some mechanisms for doing that. I know there's been some scepticism that you know this might be all words and they'll source parts out of Southeast Asia. Uh, one of the uh, guys I'm working with at NZTE went to a meeting with TALUS, which is one, one of the land projects. And they've managed to move, despite the fact that it's, a, it's I believe, a German design for the actual fighting vehicle that's been developed, they've managed to move 83% of those materials to being sourced in Australia. And they sat down and said, here are all the parts that we are not currently sourcing in Australia. Here are the prices we're buying them for. If you can do this part at this price, you've got it. Not, you know, not level playing field. So that's the environment we're working in. So politically, we're actually significantly advantaged. Um, and the other thing is, I, uh, I was actually running an engineering business in Australia for a number of years, and the there is a massive shortage in capability there because there's all these new programs coming on, but they've had the same problem as us. Engineering has been shedding jobs and capability for 20 years, and all of a sudden there's this huge new demand, and so they physically cannot scale up their capacity in time to, to take on these projects. So um, the combination of, of existing skills that need to be built on around quality, the political drive to buy local, and the shortage of around 5,000 skilled engineers and tradespeople in Australia, based on current estimates, mean that um, we can credibly get this work. Yeah. And we're doing it already in rail, so we can't, for the life of ourselves, sell into the New Zealand rail industry because we buy out of China. But Farrow ship millions of dollars a year of product into the Australian uh, rail builds for, for Bombardier right now, and the only reason they buy it off us is because it's not because we're the cheapest. We are good, our quality is very high, but it's because they've got that local content mandate, so we know they're serious about it. Councillor O'Malley. Thanks for coming and presenting here today, Gareth. Um, a few of us went on a tour of Farrah's about a year and a half ago before you arrived, and it was funny because at that point, the same point was brought up that you brought up again today, which is people outside Dunedin are not aware of the engineering capacity of the city. Um, are you aware of the Dunedin destination plan? I'm aware that it exists, but I know very little about it. So was the engineering cluster approached in the, were you, did you approach the, through the chair to John actually, did, what, how much was the engineering groups brought into the development of the plan? Uh, look, I think all sectors, we tried to communicate equally where we could with um, many residents across the city and many businesses. Uh, the, the cluster in specific terms, I don't know, I'd have to check with staff. So I just expand the question again then. Would you, the idea of the plan is that it's supposed to make Dunedin a target for both business and, in the end it sort of became a tourism plan, but it's also supposed to be a target for business as well. Would you like to sort of revisit that relationship again and, and and because it seems it's in, it's in the spirit of what you've come here to talk about, which is maybe one thing that the council can do is as it promotes the city around the country, it could promote the engineering capacity of the city as well while it does its other promotions? Yeah, I think there's definitely an opportunity to be, to be had there. And I don't know what the engineering cluster um, contributed to the original plan. I do know that the engineering cluster uh, has struggled for a sense of purpose historically, and uh, that's something that I'm trying to help fix. Um, but yes, I think that, speaking for myself, I looked at this job opportunity in Dunedin and went, come on, what the hell are you thinking? Um, but, and for, you know, I had some real reservations, because I did not see Dunedin as a place where people do business, uh, and despite the fact that I've lived here as a kid. so. I think that we do need to get that message out there, and I think that getting, you know, getting um, enterprise to need in council and industry all on the same page and singing from the same song sheet, we can we can do that. Uh, but we definitely need to get our goals aligned and our understanding aligned because I I don't think that's necessarily been the case from my 
external view. And just one last question. Um, do you think engineering is dead? Do you think manufacturing is dead? Interestingly, that's the question my board asked after they appointed me. They said, are you going to be here for five years until engineering finally dies, or, or is, there a, is there another way? I think that um, I cringe when I hear people talking about restarting Hillside or something like that. Engineering's changed, um, and if we hold on to the past, we'll never get to where engineering's going to be in 10 years' time. There will always be a need for engineering, and all I know is that it'll be a lot different in 10 years from it, how it is now, and on the trajectory, trajectory we're on at the moment, uh, we'll just keep falling behind until we become completely irrelevant. So that's the challenge to us, is to look 10 years out and say, what will engineering be like then? Um, what we know is that skilled tradespeople will become even more skilled because, uh, because they'll be in, in higher demand, there'll be less of them, and they'll need to be able to do a broader range of tasks. We know that there'll always be a market for innovative products, but that the industries those go into will change. Um, do, so I think that, and I think that some of those competitive pressures are going to shift as well, because people are starting to get more of a perception of value. Um, some of those economies where things have been going offshore for a long time are, are increasing in cost themselves. You look at labour rates in China and so forth, they are going up. They're never going to be as high as ours. But I think if we can promote, if we can stay on the forefront of innovation and productivity, and we're not there at the moment, we need to get there. Um, if we can focus on high value niche opportunities, um, you look at Waratah, uh, they are building tons of stuff out of Tokoroa of all places uh, and exporting all over the world. They're internationally owned, but they're still manufacturing in New Zealand because they're developing niche products that are top quality for their industry. And that's the kind of stuff we need to be focused on. Uh, we will never go back to producing washing machines here. Um, it's just not economic. Uh, but, but those things where um, we need to get a product to market quickly and we can leverage our ability to do things to do things rapidly, or where we're harnessing the, the value of inventors. I think there will always be a market for that, but we can't take it for granted because as soon as the engineering companies fall over, um, you can have as many inventors out building stuff as you want. They won't be able to bring them to market. And so I think we've got to get better at collaborating and we've got to stop doing the, you know, the rubbish old stuff that was from 30 years ago and, and take that long-term view to, um, to building an engineering industry of the future. And more companies will go bust along the way because the ones that are holding on to the past won't, you know, won't be able to do that. But I would hate to see all those small companies, the owner-operated ones, not get the opportunity to participate um, simply because they don't have the resources to invest themselves in that, in that evolution. Mr Chairman, um I'd like to move that we extend the time allotted for public forum beyond its half hour duration. Yep. Seconded Councillor Wilson. Um, I'll put it. All in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Uh, next questions were from Councillor Elder. Thank you, Chris. Um, welcome to this table. Um, it just so happens I've been helping one of those innovators um, recently and have admired the engineering ecosystem here because not only did Farah um, for free help him with his invention but also JTEC um, injection moulding out at Mosgiel and Kamahi Electronics is helping him as well. And so my question was, do you believe we've got a really good kind of ecosystem that's complementary to bring new product to market? Like, not just Farah, but all the other components, I suppose. I, th I think that we have the willingness, and I think that culturally in Dunedin there's a, there's a, a sense of, of willingness to support each other. I don't think it's well organised, um, and I think that... You know, it's it's everyone at their own risk. So that capability is not not well communicated. So you know, in, in your case, uh, it might have worked well, but that might be from luck, from having the right connections. And what we should be able to do is provide that opportunity to be supported to anyone who's who's coming up with a credible, you know, innovation. So I think 
I think the culture is there, but I think we need the structures in place to say, here is how you actually do it, here is the support that's available to you, um, and get people really communicating about those opportunities so that, so that people know that they can come to, to companies like ours and, and know what level of support is actually out there. So do you think that story should be sold more? Or yes, sold more? yep, absolutely. I'd like it if someone comes out of the engineering school at Christchurch and says, I've got this great idea, I need to take it to market. You know, the place to do that is Dunedin because that's where all the support for this kind of stuff is. Now, right now, the support might be there, but I can guarantee you that person graduating out of Christchurch doesn't know it. No. Um, and if we can formalise that, that's where we, ins we, don't just have to, we don't have to generate all the ideas here. We have to generate the environment where those ideas can become a reality. And that's about how we organise, how we communicate, and, and having a real vision for what we're doing with this, um, with this engineering support. Thank you. Councillor Vandas. You've said that engineering's changing a lot. Does that mean that your old traditional engineer skills, the kind of skills that they had at Hillside, now need to be replaced by younger people that are computer literate? Or is there still a space for some of those experienced older engineers? I think we need to make sure that there's still a space for those, those engineers. I think that they have a lot to contribute. We're having that debate at the moment because we've got some guys who simply refuse to learn the newer equipment and yet they're amazingly skilled tradespeople. And so we try and make sure they're in roles where, you know, some of that new stuff is good for particular types of work, but the guy who can just pick up a piece of metal and turn it into something is actually often faster and more accurate. And so we want to we want to encourage a mix of those skills. And you know, and you know, in the long run, are we going to have the same roles for those people? Probably not. But we're going to need them for another 20 years. So we should keep supporting them. Um, we make sure when we bring on apprentices that they learn all the old manual stuff first, so they won't touch a CNC machine for a year. Um, because we, we value that intimate knowledge of the metals and how they operate um, before you get to just go punch it into a screen. So yes, it'll move more towards computers, but I don't think that has to rule out any of... In fact, I think we have to continue to support those traditional skills that require that intimate knowledge. I know of a few older engineers who are either working in their workshops or cutting scrap at a, a scrapyard. Um, are you anticipating that you'll have jobs for those kind of experienced old, old guys, or is it more the computer literate that you're after? I would certainly expect and hope that we'd have jobs for those, uh, for those older guys. Um, that's where it gets really interesting when we start talking about government support. For me to bring on a guy who's 58, and by the way, we have, we have a, an older workforce at Farrah, um, none of the original team anymore, but... Um, but a lot of guys in their 50s and 60s. Uh, I had a guy come to me, a bit upset, a couple of weeks ago because he thought that you know he'd just hit 65 and we were going to push him out. And I said, no, you you want to turn up to work every morning, you turn up to work every morning, and when you when you're done, you're done. The risk is that you know it's physical work and people's bodies start to give out. So we need to get more adaptive about our work practices to say, well, is there any reason we can't create a job where a guy who's 64 who's still got the passion but not necessarily the energy, can only work four hours a day, or can do something a bit different. And I think, um, I'll, I'll be honest, companies like mine tend to get a little bit gun shy because you've got oh s challenges there, and, and we're missing out on some of those skilled people. So I'd like to find a, a pathway for them to contribute and, and be back doing what they love. You talk about engineering changing. Is it changing from, in, instead of machining material down, of building material up using 3D printers, is, is that becoming significant yet? It's interesting, when I got into this space six, seven years ago, um, people said to me, people, machining things down is done, it's not coming back, and, and 3D printing's taking over, and it still hasn't. 3D printing or additive manufacturing will be a component, and we need to make sure we're aware of where it fits. Right now, the the time taken to produce a part and the cost of materials is substantially higher than conventional methods. And so I think that conventional methods will be a part of the mix for at least another 10 years, probably 20. Um, but there will come a point where, where, that, where, where the economics cross over and we need to be ready for that and making sure that we're still on the forefront of it when that, when that convergence happens. 
Okay, and last question, um, automation investment. Yep. Have you got access to government funds if you want to put a major investment into automating some particular process? No, we don't, and we should, and that is absolutely part of the feasibility because uh, it will be within the scope of the feasibility because um, we need to accept that uh, there is automation at all levels. Right now, most engineering shops will have one man to one machine. Um, I would rather have, again, looking many years into the future, I would rather have one man to four machines and have that man really well paid and really satisfied in what he's doing. And that's going to require a level of automation. But that's how we're going to keep that guy. And I shouldn't say that guy, that person, because I'd also like to see, uh, I'd also like to see a little bit more diversity in our workforce. Um, that's going to make that person uh, actually have a career and actually have job satisfaction and and be engaged with what they're doing over and above running a piece of equipment. We're actively investigating that at the moment for for my company, but I think that if we want to be serious about it, we need to be able to say, well. Um, this is where it's headed, this is the long-term view. For companies that are willing to get on board with that, um, the government needs to come in and look at what, they, what they're willing to co-fund. Um, you know, it has to have a, a good economic rationale, but again, if we can get this engineering hub thing together, we can bring in some of those automation technologies, and a lot of it's, there's been a focus on what's happening on the machine. Most of your money is spent getting the work to, and to the machine and back off again. Um, I'm exaggerating, but a lot of your money is spent doing that, and that's where a lot of your potential for improvement is. It's, it's actually how the whole work flows through the business rather than just what it's doing on a machine. Um, those are the things we need to be we need to be researching, and Callahan's doing a bit of work on it now, but it's it's very much a side um, sort of a side fringe investment for them. Um, but those are the things we need to be showing in the centre of excellence, and then businesses can come in and say, that's applicable to my, to my company. You know, this is going to generate this X productivity improvement. Um, you know, government, can you help me, you know, support me to do that? And I think that's, that's exactly where we want to head. Because most of the other companies in the world have had significant government funding to get that automation, haven't they? We they just have. don't hear. If you, yeah, if you look at, uh, you know, Labour in Germany is more expensive than here, and yet small engineering businesses in Germany are thriving. But they're doing that through not direct subsidies, but uh, a lot of uh, grants and support for process improvement and automation. And, and that's the model we want to follow. Um, there's some similar things going on in, in smaller districts in, in the US. So I'm meeting with some people in uh, Illinois to look at what they've done in a few weeks. Um, just to, to find out what's worked for them. And they've developed an uh, Illinois Engineering Excellence in something. Um, a, a group that they basically research and look at what's going to be good for businesses and then they get government funding in to come and help do that. And it's all about process and automation. And if we're not willing to get on that bandwagon, then we should be milking our engineering companies for all they're worth until they die, because that, be that will be the conclusion. Great. Well, good luck with the cluster, and please let us know if there's anything you think we can do. Thank you. Cheers. Councillor Lord. Yeah, sorry, Gareth. I just thought about another question, but I was just thinking that, so you, should, you said <clears throat> if you could get, it was it half a percent of the budget they've got, and, and you talked about the figures between 50 and $150 million a year, and I'm assuming you're meaning that's continuing. Yep. But, but so what I'm trying to ask, thinking about that, like if you were, for example, the example you gave us building lifting machines to lift helicopters to the top deck from the bottom deck and that sort of thing, would you envisage that ships would come up the harbour and actually get fitted here or you would produce those things, package them up and send them and have people install them somewhere else? Correct. The, um, the ships will be built in Adelaide and, uh, and West Australia and they will be fully fitted out and commissioned there. So anything we make has to be able to be loaded on a ship and sent over there, which is not much different from if it was shipped around the coast in Australia or from Europe. So there's a model there that, that works. So we'll build sub-assemblies, we'll pack them in containers um, unless they're too big, and then we'll ship them off to Australia. And I'm just trying to work in my head dollars to, to workers, but I mean, what might $100 million a year look like in terms of extra workers? Could that be as few as 10 or 20, or would it be no. 30, 40, 50? Um, I'm just trying to not give too much away about my company here. 
Um, <laughs> the, uh, I would say, look, $100 million a year in this space. Yeah, no, 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 I, no it's, a, it's, a, it's a fair question. I think the $100 million a year for a business in our space, assuming we get more productive as we go along this path, which is an absolute requirement, um, you would be looking at three to 500 jobs directly involved in it. Um, so we're, we're substantially short of 100 million and we employ about 150 people at the moment. So um, it gives you a, some sort of benchmark. Yep. Councillor Lafiso. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Mr Evans, for your time and, and commitment to this kaupapa, this vision. Um, but forgive my ignorance, uh, but so the engineering hub that you want to build or create, uh, the, the funding from the government's development fund, what would, it, what would that be used for specifically? Okay, that, that will be an outcome of the feasibility study, so all I can give you here is my ideas um, and uh, it may be that those change radically once we've got someone full-time working on this project. Um, in my view, it would be um, some, so there's a few areas. One would be supporting um, education, which may not be extra funding because we're already putting more funding into education. Uh, one would be um, actually building a facility where uh, new technologies can be trialled and evaluated and people can come in and, and learn about them and what they mean for their business. Uh, it would definitely involve, um, it would definitely involve uh, collaboration space so we can get businesses together working on projects together and that may even involve some support for things like tender responses so um, you know a, a lot of companies can't even respond to some of these opportunities because they don't have the professional skills so teaching people how to how to build their businesses so a lot of business support side of it um, and then, uh, so that's what the engineering hub would do, and so there'd be some space for, you know, the latest equipment, um, educational facilities, and bringing in people from, you know, if there's a guy who is the absolute expert on additive manufacturing around the world, we should be bringing him here to talk to local business. Uh, we shouldn't be getting it fourth hand, which is what's happening at the moment. So, so facilities for, for that and a place for people to come together is, is an important part of it. And the second part of it is, you know, there's no point knowing more about what we're doing unless we've got the capacity to actually do something about it. And that's where building a model for co-funding of, of investment um, comes in because we, we need to be able to develop that model. Um, and so I think those are probably, those are probably the main areas where I think actual cash would need to be spent. Um, and I think that's probably enough that you'd then get private investment behind it to, um, you know, to follow on from, from, that, um, from that capability. Oh, the other thing, of course, is when we look at big things like defence, you can buy a ferret because we've got the quality and, more importantly, we've got the balance sheet so you, so you know that we're going to be able to supply over a long period of time. We may want government to, to provide some underwriting so that if you buy off the engineering hub or the engineering group or whatever it ends up being, that um, you've got the same security as if you're buying it off us or buying it off government. And, and the Australian government's doing this for small businesses in Australia already in this space. So that the guy, like uh, United Engineering down the road from us, they have five guys. A defence contractor cannot buy off him. He, he doesn't pass the audit. So if we can provide some government underwriting so that those smaller operators can give the same level of security, that puts them on a level playing field with us. And I think that's, that how that would work economically is a bit tricky um, in my head, but I think that's really part of what we need to provide so that they get a fair opportunity as well. So how many um, operators are there in Dunedin that you would be concerned with? Uh, as in how many engineering companies? Um, that's a very good question. I should know that, being on the committee of the engineering cluster, and I, in the region, I'd say it's probably in the, the low 100s, but I don't know. I, that's that's a wild guess. And one last um, question is, and, and I'm coming from a um, a community workers' perspective. Is that, uh, do you know if those companies in Dunedin are 
all living wage employers? Uh, I don't know that. I know that uh, I know that we are, uh, but. But I would suspect, knowing how tough the industry is, I would suspect there'll be some people on the, some business owners, who feel economically unable to be living wage work, uh, operators. And I'd like to see that change. And again, that's where we support those businesses. They support their staff, and it, it helps everyone. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Evans, um, for your presentation. Um, I just had a very simple question, which is you talked about, you articulated your view of Dunedin as a place to do business before you came here, yep. and I'm really interested to hear how you would artic articulate that view in summary now that you've been here for a little while. Well, as, as you can see, I've, I've kind of thrown myself into it um, fairly uh, enthusiastically, so I, I guess that tells you a lot about my perception. I think that um, as a place to do business, there's there's still some challenges, and that's mainly geographic and labour force related. Mm -hmm. And so would I go out and say to people, come and move your business to Dunedin right now? There's some challenges around that. Um, but in terms of the business community, the way the community comes together here, the way the community collaborates, and and the willingness to, to work together, the ideas, you look at some of these great businesses like Scott's and ASEA and, um, and a number of others that, you know, that, actively get involved in each other's businesses. I think it's a great place to do business and we've, we've got to take those roadblocks away and we've just got to make it easier for people to come here. I'm stunned, like technology companies, um, it's, my original background was in, was in software and electronics and so forth and, you know, in Auckland, um, for, a, for a developer, 100 grand is barely a living wage. Um, and I know that's a bad thing to say, but, uh, but, down here, you move that same company down here and bring 20, 30 software developers with you, you know, the environment they work in, the, the cost of living here, the culture here, the accessibility of everything here, there's no reason more companies shouldn't move here. We're just not, we're not telling the story and we do have those few roadblocks that, you know, where do we house them, where do we, you know, do we bring them down here and put them in a rundown 100 year old building, is that going to cut the mustard? Maybe not. But I think that those are actually relatively simple problems to solve. Um, if the culture's right, and if the, if the, you know, the community's behind it, um, and, and it is, then taking away those, those practical, technical roadblocks shouldn't be a challenge. So I'd say, um, you know, let's, let's change that narrative, and, and there's no reason we can't, uh, we can't really get a lot more happening here. Look forward to the headline tomorrow. Sounds like we've run out of questions, but Gareth, thank you so much. No um, I, I, I heard what you said about the engineering industry in Dunedin, and I, I've been a believer in that for many years, that for Dunedin, Dunedin has great engineering skills. It just needs to start to look at being a little bit more innovative and, and being a little bit more out, out looking for that cluster type work where they can bring all the skills together and I, I think it's great to have someone who's come into the community to give some leadership to that and I'm sure us as councillors around the table will, will all be prepared to support that. Well, thank you very much and thank you all for your support and for taking so much of your uh, precious time to, uh, to talk to me today. Thank you.